The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, welcome everybody uh, out there watching this uh, all over the internet and uh, those of you who are friends of UCSD and uh, we are pleased to welcome two alums of UC San Diego, uh, Stefano Spagna, who's uh, located at uh, Quantum Design, as long as as well as Ivy Phipps, who's also an alum of UCSD. In fact, they both have the same advisors, uh, Stefano, for your PhD with Professor Brian Maple, who's now our chair, and Ivy for your master's degree. And it's a pleasure to welcome you guys both back. And Quantum Design has been a huge uh, supporter, friend, and and kind of uh, resource for for folks far and wide. And Quantum Design plays a huge role in uh, branches of physics as diverse as material science, quantum information, and even in cosmology, the stuff that, that we study in our laboratory. And they've been great partners and friends, so thank you guys for coming back. Okay, Stefano is the Chief Technology Officer, and Ivy is in charge of Quantum Design's dilution refrigeration technology. And it's a tool that is used uh, well beyond this campus and well beyond San Diego, certainly. And it has uh, dramatic implications for technology and what we call fundamental physics, revealing the properties of, of matter and energy at its coldest and most quantum state. And it has vast applications, perhaps, in the you know, multi-trillion dollar business of electronics eventually, and, and perhaps even in quantum computing and things like that. So we hope to talk about that in this uh, in this little discussion. So Ivy, you're in charge of dilution refrigeration, as I said, a technology that enables ultra low temperatures. I always think it's funny because you guys, you know, uh, I remember looking at uh, Quantum Design's website a long time ago, but even before I came here, or around the time I came here and thinking about San Diego as a place I think of as really warm, nice balmy temperatures, and then you have technology that gets down how low, Ivy, can you get down? 50 millikelvin. So this is 51 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero, the temperature below which nothing Thing can be co cooled. Uh, and so this is uh, really, you've been at the forefront of how we understand materials and how they behave at low temperatures. And in the so-called degeneracy states, when they behave purely quantum mechanically, you can't describe them as little billiard balls bouncing off of one another. So it's really wonderful to have you here. And uh, first, I like to always start with personal questions, so nothing too personal. No, no pin numbers will be revealed. Uh, but uh, but how, is, how does it feel coming back to campus? How often do you get to come back to campus? Actually, uh, quite often, and it's always a great experience uh, to see the campus growing. I get lost uh, every time I come here yeah. because there's a new building. Fewer uh, parking nice spaces thing. by the day. Yes, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, as you said, we do have a lot of friends here at UCSD, and this uh, relationship is really important to us, and uh, that's why we... You know, we built our first uh, quantum design uh, material discovery lab here at UCSD yeah. because of this collaboration. Yeah, it's a wonderful resource that we have uniquely, I think. Um, although many uh, universities use your technology in their demonstration labs to have actually one that was dedicated and donated by quantum design. Uh, for use for our undergraduates and even some graduate students sneak in there on occasion to right. learn about the properties of low temperature materials. And that's, a, of course, I think a hallmark of what you guys do. You make it really simple. I mean, it's not simple to understand it or how to build it, but you guys make it turnkey. And, and explain why, maybe, Ivy, why is that important to your users and the end and user side to have something that's like bulletproof and just works every time? Time. It mm -hmm. takes less time. Um, some labs want the understanding, the fundamental understanding of how their systems are running. Other labs, that's not their focus. Mm -hmm. That doesn't need to be their focus. They can immediately access what they would like to research. Mm -hmm. And time is money. Resources are short in supply right now. That's a big deal. Yeah. Okay. It's really wonderful uh, to have that resource and, and also to, you know, start as early in the STEM pipeline as possible, training these, you know, uh, undergrads to learn how to operate this technology, which is, you know, turnkey, but they still have that nuts and bolts understanding of the physics that goes into it. So we educators really appreciate that. So um, maybe, uh, uh, Stefano, you, you can describe how is it that these superconducting devices, uh, things like squids and exotic and, and kind of creepy crawly things that, that we use in our technology and cosmology, how are they used around the world and what's quantum design's role in fabricating them and enabling them really for scalability? So quantum design is really the leading provider of nanotechnology tools around the 
globe, and that includes the squids. Uh, you know, our uh, design of uh, all teen film squid really was uh, a breakthrough when it came. Uh, and uh, we use squids uh, as uh, in our instruments in the squid magnetometer uh, to measure really tiny magnetic moments of materials. And people, uh, in fact, use the MPMS. The MPMS-3 is the third generation of 30 years of culmination of putting squids into instruments, um, really to research new compounds, new superconducting compounds, and uh, discover even higher transition temperatures for superconductors. And Squids those... are by, widely used as detectors in mm -hmm. cosmology as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's, uh, for just physical applications, there's mm -hmm. uh, squids. So it, it, the, the general terms for these uh, squids uh, is, uh, is really a magnetic flux to voltage converter. That really, that's what the actual device does. And be able to use it is, uh, is, is difficult because its sensitivity, not only it's the greatest strength, but it's also its greatest weaknesses because you have to shield everything else that be moving that mm -hmm. you don't want to measure mm -hmm. uh, by the squid. So yeah. you have to do it correctly. Now, are these used in any medical applications? That, of that, course. Yeah. So, so does the patient have to be cooled down to 50 millical? Does uh, IV actually do that to not patients? Not all or? the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, they are used for uh, uh, study uh, ellipse. Uh, uh, People, how do you say ellipsis? Uh, uh, epileptic. Yeah. epileptic seizures epileptic, yeah. or mm -hmm. so uh, they're study. Uh, they're, yeah, they're used for that. Mm -hmm. So brainwave sensing, brainwave things sensing, like that. Mm -hmm. That's right. So these devices, these superconducting quantum interference devices, I believe right. I have that right, they can sense, you know, things that are basically at one quantum of magnetism. So the smallest possible magnetic fields that could be uh, many, many times, billions of times, you know, smaller than the Earth's magnetic field, maybe even a trillions of times. Yes. And magnetic fields are very hard to block and shield out. So to, to get something that's reliable in the lab, in the field, in diagnostic or clinic offices is really impressive. Um, but you do more than kind of that sort of um, applied technology, which is used for, you know, diagnostics or medical things, like I said, or even in our field where we're using them as amplifiers for detecting these ultra faint signals from the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, a lot of what other people do using these around the world, I remember going to your, uh, to your facility, to the factory and seeing all the places that you're sending these machines out to around the world. And do you guys get mm -hmm. to go to these places and visit with, with potential uh, customers or is that, uh, is that not the chief no, technology officer is at role in the, that's certainly not my role, although they do <laughs> keep yet. trying to ship me out with the DRs. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, that's, that's certainly one of the satisfaction. Of, you know, I think one of the questions later on mm -hmm. is what, uh, what is uh, most that you appreciate about your work. And it's really seeing our technology used in the, by researchers, the end users, mm -hmm. and how the technology that we design into these instruments that often is so hard to create from, from scratch, you know, from fundamental pr principle, how that gives an edge to our instruments compared to uh, other products that might be out, out there, and how that really has a huge impact on the ultimate research, research of uh, scientists. Mm -hmm. And there's been many times during the company history where our instruments have really fueled uh, some major breakthroughs. Even the first squid magnetometer, the MPMS, uh, became highly sought instrument right after the discovery of ITC superconductors that right. accumulated in 1987 with the Woodstock of physics. Mm -hmm. After that, we were inundated by uh, orders for the magnetic property measurement system. That's the MPS. And even today, That's the MPS. MPS. Mm -hmm. And even today, that really remains the instrument of choice for researchers who who are uh, looking for new compounds, superconducting compounds that have even higher transition temperatures. Mm -hmm. And in terms of breakdown, that's probably your dominant, you know, kind of uh, customer or, or you know, uh, product that you guys are producing. But lately, you've also been getting more and more into dilution refrigeration. I thought maybe Ivy, you could explain first of all what is dilution refrigeration for those that may not be familiar uh, out there, or what does it do? Uh, as I said, you you have the coldest part of San Diego on a typical day, and down down in the, the valley where you guys work. And and these are kind of I usually describe it when someone asks me for a technical description of how they wear. I say it's magic, and uh, a, mir a miracle <laughs> happens here. And uh, but functionally, what do they do? I and mean, you flip a switch. And what happens? Uh, 
Well, ours is a button because oh, that's button. Okay, what we sorry. specialize in. <laughs> uh, we provide the easy user mm -hmm. interfaces. Um, but essentially, with your normal physical properties measurement system, a PPMS system, um, you can access down to 2 Kelvin, thereabouts. And then the 50 millikelvin comes from the more or less cryostat within your cryostat, a la your dilution refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, so it has two modes of operation. One is just pure, like normal evaporative pumping, evaporative cooling process, where you're just purely removing energy from it that'll access certain temperature range, thereabouts 1 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll allow you to have a continuous measurement down to it, rather than having the disjoint of which thermometers and control and a seamless integration of temperature control. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the dilution cooling phase, which is where the interplay between the helium-3 and helium-4 isotopes actually become a bit more important. Mm -hmm. uh, that is where we get our 50 millikelvin cooling power. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the energetic exchange between those isotopes that is really the, the niche yeah. of mm -hmm. dilution refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And these devices, uh, do they, you know, consume helium? Like uh, as, as you were, and you and I were graduate students, we had to dump in vast quantities of liquid helium, which at, at the time cost about the a same amount as, you know, fine Italian wine. Uh, <laughs> but now it's gotten much more expensive. So you, you presumably don't need any of these consumable liquid helium um, supplies, correct? It is a closed system. Mm -hmm. So once the mixture is set, after a while, of course, helium is a very small atom. So after a while, but it will deplete. But that's decade. Mm -hmm. So for like a decade, mm -hmm. you have the same source of helium. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a big deal because yeah. you're only paying that expenditure once, mm -hmm. maybe a second time, depending on maintenance or other things that mm -hmm. can potentially go wrong. But that's the same. That's way less than any of the big cryostats and having to potentially like leak check that mm -hmm. and all of the ways that things can be improved for our dilution of future is going to be you know pretty minimal compared to the big right. cryostats mm -hmm. yeah so. so um yeah is there uh are there challenges and um, listeners out uh, uh on our audience may have heard about the global helium shortage that's ongoing Obviously, you use some ordinary isotopic helium-4, which has two protons, two neutrons. Helium-3 has one fewer neutron, so it has two protons, two, one neutron. Um, is there a shortage of helium-3 as well as a shortage of helium-4? There is never enough helium-3. <laughs> uh, but you know, right now, there, I think the prices are coming down a little bit, so it would indicate that there is a you know normal supply, but there is never enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, helium in general is is the fuel of our uh, business. You know, we yeah. we are uh, dependent on uh, liquid liquefying helium for testing our instruments and. Uh, you know, if you do a short flashback, 2012, seven years ago, Quantum Design was consuming about 10,000 liters of liquid helium per month. That's 120,000 uh, liters of liquid helium per year. Millions of dollars. We put it to work because it was uh, calibrating our instruments, mm -hmm. validating, uh, you know, calibration of customer units. But at the same time, it was also waste because all the helium was was basically released to the atmosphere and lost forever. So after uh, a while, this became unsustainable because of uh, helium shortages around the world and then the fact that the price kept increasing. So we really set ourselves to create a line of products for our customers where they can uh, not only recycle the helium but liquefy it. Mm -hmm. And we ourselves have installed a pretty major helium plant at Quantum Design so that the helium can be recovered, purified, and liquefied again. Mm -hmm. And as a comparison, seven years later now, uh, we are using 18,000 liters of helium, which is an 85% reduction mm -hmm. of helium consumption over seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So and that and it gets better, you know. The, we are really committed at trying to keep this helium molecule as much as we can on Earth. And as an analogy, our uh, chief operating officer always says that every day we uh, basically fill up about three thousand balloons. Mm. And uh, but instead of letting them go, we actually use them at three weightings <laughs> before we actually release them <laughs> into the sky. <laughs> so you know, this is really where helium conservation. Uh, comes in play trying to keep the helium 
uh, working uh, for this industry as much as possible. And that's why on July 10th of this year, we, uh, Quantum Design, have launched Helium Conservation Day. Mm. And there was a uh, very pretty major uh, event, a Quantum Design, that was also... Um, uh, there was a webinar on it, and many people from around the world uh, contributed clips from their labs to, to, to say how they were uh, recycling helium. And the event is really one to commemorate, the, of course, the great Dutch physicist Carmeli Omnes, who liquefied helium in 1908. And uh, for the first time, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, really increase awareness about the helium. Helium is a non-renewable -re source. Then once it's lost into the atmosphere, it's gone forever. Yeah. And we want to do our part in not only uh, enabling our customers to re recover it, but do it here at the factory. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes people talk in my field of cosmology that, you know, humans are made of star stuff. But, you know, actually, we're also made of a lot of stuff that was produced in the Big Bang, uh, which is it's hydrogen and isotopes of hydrogen, but also a little bit of helium and some of that helium, if not all of that helium uh, that that we, uh, you know, find in our local local part of the of the universe, shall we say, or in a great deal of it was produced in the Big Bang. And there's only, you know, there's only one big bang that we know about for sure. And so it's hard to think about uh, renewables in that sense. So we got to be careful with what we do have. I want to um, uh, move on to you know, some of the applications of dilution refrigeration. And people have, have heard a lot of interesting um, of, of advances in quantum computing and many different uh, maybe competitors or maybe other you know colleagues or uh, so forth in the field of quantum materials are using dilution refrigeration to get down to low temperatures to operate these new devices which have so much promise uh, potentially for solving very previously intractable problems in, in computer science and physics and simulations and math, biology, et cetera. Uh, can you say something, Ivy, about potential applications or how people are using dilution refrigeration to enable uh, research or development in quantum computing? I think the application would be more for assessing the quality of the quantum materials that would eventually be utilized with quantum computing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole bread and butter of the, our QD dilution refrigerator is that we can do these experiments quickly. Mm -hmm. um, some of the bigger cryostats take at least like a week mm -hmm. to prepare, and they can measure many samples at a time, mm -hmm. but that's a week, if not a month, of preparation for hopefully a successful measurement. Mm -hmm. We can do it in eight hours. Wow. And That's so a, you would yeah. test the materials that would go into the aquatic. Ah, okay. So we can care, we can fully characterize the material mm -hmm. before its design incorporation into something called. A quantum, quantum computer. computer. Oh, okay. Very so interesting. That's where I would consider our bread and butter to mm -hmm. be really in the contribution to quantum computing. So is that another MPM mass or is it a low temperature? Because the one you described earlier is a one Kelvin ish or you know, perhaps 50 it's 50 millikelvin. It's a dilution refrigerator. Yeah, it's a dilution yeah. refrigerator. And for instance, just this uh, uh, June, uh, in June uh, 2019, uh, uh, some measurements uh, on a new material, quantum material, a pi chloride single crystal. Um, it discovered, uh, we helped uh, make some measurements, I see susceptibility measurements on this uh, material and, and by uh, scientists at Quantum Design, uh, Manani Van Nayalan, that uh, performed the measurements. And he helped a collaboration of inter, uh, coll international collaboration of scientists uh, that was led by Pen Cheng Bay at uh, Rice University in discovering a new quantum material. And they believe that this is the first experimental verification of discovering a quantum spin liquid. Mm. As you know, the quantum spin liquids were first postulated by Philip Anderson, a Nobel laureate in 1973. Mm -hmm. And it took 46 years to basically uh, discover this, this material. Uh, this material is attracted a lot of, uh, in, uh, a lot of uh, attention because of its properties, uh, where the spin, uh, the, basically the atomic la lattice of the material doesn't let the spin uh, or, uh, order in any form. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it can be really used for uh, quant creating qubits. Mm -hmm. And so since in the 1980s, there's been a lot of interest, uh, uh, both in superconductivity, trying to explain superconductivity using this quantum uh, squid uh, 
quantum spin liquids, and also the fact that they may be unable to create qubits for a quantum computer. Uh, so it's uh, the dilution refrigerators are really used, our dilution refrigerators are really used by material scientists that want to focus on discovering the next generation of quantum materials that would eventually fuel going to devices that would fuel the quantum uh, computing revolution mm -hmm. of the future. So while our instruments, our dilution refrigerators are rather small and they cannot be uh, built into a quantum computer are really used for another purpose and mm -hmm. more fundamental yeah. purpose, which is discovering new materials that enables the, this quantum the technologies. Mm -hmm, the basic properties, fundamental physics that go right. into it. Good. Um, so I'm going to finish up with a couple questions about uh, your relationship to UCSD. So as I said, uh, UCSD has benefited a lot from, uh, from quantum design and uh, uh, vice versa. So how did your education here and experiences that you had here shape where you ended up today? I'll start with Ivy, maybe. I have, I suppose, a simple answer to that. I was in Brian Maple's lab. Um, I started there as an undergraduate, worked there as a lab tech, um, was able to be in the right place at the right time for when a chief o a technical officer from quantum design came over to Brian's lab and asked if there was anybody that would be interested in an internship. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so I ended up doing my master's at within Brian's lab, mm -hmm. but with the material sciences and engineering program. Oh, okay. um, so I, my, my degrees do cover physics, material sciences, and engineering. Um, and uh, had a great time doing it. Um, Brian's lab afforded me a lot of opportunities, the least of which is being able to transition to a career with quantum design. Yeah, wonderful. So. And what about you? you so, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, a little bit Me too. Back, was yeah. very uh, <laughs> very fortunate to you know to work in Brian's lab. He was I earned my PhD under his guidance, and you know Brian really taught me. I was a great mentor. Uh, really taught me uh, to uh, to really uh, great attributes to become not only a, a, a good researcher but eventually uh, a leader of a technology company, and that is that. Uh, you really have to uh, work through challenges and problems that will occur in whatever you are pursuing and uh, and be tenacious and really looking to a uh, successful uh, completion uh, of a research project mm -hmm. and also be very flexible yeah. because as you discover things you may find out new solutions that take you to a different path that uh, again may be even more rewarding of what you are seeking to begin with so yeah. be flexible and tenacious and mm -hmm. that's something that really I think I got from Brian yeah yeah I, I also benefit from from my co namesake Brian and uh, he's uh, he's an invaluable resource he's such a such a, a, a wonderful figure in this university's history and uh, certainly in the in in the company that that you guys are a part of uh, i want to finish up with you know what, what for kind of a opportunity for you guys to speak to a future you know person who may be like ivy is now you know now or wanting to be where ivy is now and wanting to know what's the best part of your job what do you like most about the you know opportunities resources and so forth that you have at quantum design it's it's almost odd that the culture at Quantum Design is not that much different than the culture at the lab mm -hmm. that I came from. You know, it inspires open-mindedness. It inspires conversation about difficult problems, regardless of whether the people you're talking about are in, within that same field or within mm -hmm. that same product. Mm -hmm. um, but the open-mindedness for conversation, for problem solving, and, and just different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, that's something that uh, I know that Stefano has carried through. And because I came after, I definitely saw that transition. Right. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to work with a group of people that have that uh, generosity of spirit, generosity mm -hmm. of their time, because mm -hmm. everybody is busy. Yeah. Um, but they, they will stop and, and you know, just figure it out. Yeah. And you know, sometimes, like Stephanie was saying, different perspectives lead to different pathways of thinking, which lead to different solutions that one normally wouldn't have come to on their own. Yeah. And that's... A very, very vital part of at least our industry. I'm assuming any company would benefit from those dynamics. Um, but specifically for a technologically based company that has to stay on the forefront of innovation, mm -hmm. that's an important um, dynamic to have within yeah. a group. Yeah, whenever I go down there, I've been. Uh, 
been uh, permitted on the campus there a couple times. And the thing that always strikes me is the curiosity and the passion of the people that work there for, you know, the, the uh, from the line, you know, worker to all the way up to the managers. Uh, there's this relentless curiosity and passion for what they're the mission of the company. And, and what about you? What are your well, I think I've talked to before about, uh, you know, being really uh, my, you know, satisfaction of this, this job is really seeing our instruments used by end users mm -hmm. and also collaborating with them and listening to them to what they need. You know, at the end of the day, we are instrument makers and we're trying to solve a problem, uh, really uh, not something esoteric, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we enjoy and engage with uh, researchers and we find out what is that you're trying to do. Yeah. And for instance, uh, that's how the heat capacity measurements that uh, we have uh, engineered and now it's an automated system is probably uh, one of our most best selling measurement options was something that a lot of people came to us and said, you know, it would be really great to do the heat capacity uh, measurements, but you can't do it. It's really hard to do. Right. And, you know, for us to go to uh, the, uh, you know, the tenacity of like doing it mm -hmm. and then really finding a way, a uh, way that wasn't done before uh, and making something that is now used worldwide everywhere. I mean, literally there are tens if not hundreds of papers per month that come out of in uh, scientific journals yeah. from our instruments. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous uh, amount of pride that we have there. I can imagine. Well, uh, Ivy Phipps and uh, Stefano Spagna, thank you so much for coming back to your alma mater mm -hmm. and uh, sharing some of your experiences at Quantum Design with us. The future looks incredibly bright and promising and they're uh, with all your capabilities. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.